Okay, um, so what we were doing was um, performing some kind of request to the Modbus simulator using MBT GET. Um, what we are going to do now is uh, use another tool that is included in the Metasploit framework. Um, so as it takes a long time to launch uh, Metasploit in the VM, I suggest that you start by typing in um, MSF console right now. Okay, so these were the commands used to perform uh, Modbus queries, and now we're going to switch to the next one. Uh, so we're going to launch MSF console and then use the Modbus client, which is an auxiliary module. Still not loaded. Okay, so I'm gonna play around a bit and change the values. Okay, so here I have the Metasploit uh, console. Um, is it okay for everyone? Have you been able to, to launch it? Okay, so I will use an auxiliary module that's uh, into uh, scanner, SCADA, and then it's Modbus client. By typing in info, you can have some information on the module. Um, so there was previously a um, Modbus client module that only allowed people to uh, write values to coils, so that was kind of limited, so I, uh, let's say I modified it, so it's now part of the, it's not part of the Metasploit framework, so how to use it? Um, first of all, you have to take a look at what kind of uh, action you can do, so show actions, I think, yes. So you can read coil, read the register, write to a coil, or write to a register, so, for example, I'm going to set action to uh, read the value of our register. Then I'm going to take a look at the options. So, of course, you need to set up your target. So, once again, it's going to be uh, localhost. Um, you have to set the data address where you want to read. For example, for me, let's say... I want to read um, value at 5, maybe. And then you just type in run. That's how you run the auxiliary modules. And as you can see, uh, the value stored at the register number 5 is 4, which is funny because, yes. OK, so let's try something else the previous address, and it's 3. So yes, you can see that those are the, the values that I queried. Um, maybe it's not interesting to 
but not to let's say to spend too much time I'm just going to show you that you can modify the action as well um, right register uh, and then I have to set the data let's say I want to write uh, one to three uh, data address is four and then I run as you can see it says that it succeeded and it is true have you been able to do the same for those of you who are following Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm going to try to... Uh, well, I do not know how to make the text bigger, but it's Modbus Client in one word. Everything is lowercase. I'm sorry, control? Nope. Yeah, but... So here are it, um, and I'm guessing uh, control minus is for lowering the size. Let's say my keyboard mapping is very specific. Anyway. So let me just go back to the slides. Yeah, so um, that was on the simulator. Now I think it's time to try to move on to the, the real PLCs. Um, there's something very important to know. Uh, you should never, never, never perform any test on a live ICS systems because there are so much uh, at risk. Uh, usually what you can do is try to uh, do your test on a lab like this one uh, or you can try to do the test during a maintenance phase of a plant or a factory. Uh, in my experience uh, most factories uh, shut down at least one week uh, each year so try to, I know it's difficult but uh, you can try to plan your test during this specific phase. Um, Okay, so the, the first phase uh, would be the recon. So we're going to try to do a port scan and identify the ICS on the network. So I just uh, plugged in uh, a Wi-Fi access point. Sorry. So here you have the SSID and the password. Uh, just try to connect and tell me if it works. Yeah, it's kind of a funny SSID. Is it okay for you? Did you succeed in connecting? If so, you can try to ping uh, the two PLCs. Here you have the IP addresses. It's .5 for the Schneider and .50 for the Siemens. They should answer to ping request. Uh, let me try. Yeah, works for the Schneider and for the Siemens. Okay. Yolo swag. I'm going to put it again.
Okay, so let's start with uh, using Nmap. So Nmap is the de facto tool for performing uh, any kind of reconnaissance or uh, let's say <coughs> port scanning. However, it can be quite harmful to do so on ICS. Uh, on a related subject, I, once I was doing some um, penetration tests on building uh, automation and I just did a Nmap full TCP uh, port scan of one uh, was kind of a PLC that was handling the lights and the uh, air conditioning of the building. And then Nmap started hanging and the phone started ringing. So when you do a pen test, you know that when the phone rings, it's never good, never good news. So actually, uh, all the communication cards just crashed because most of the time when you're talking ICS, uh, the devices have, let's say, some weak TCP IP stack. So it's quite easy to, uh, to perform a denial of service, sometimes only by performing a, um, an Nmap scan. You can find all, also two interesting stories from the NIST standard uh, about people trying to perform um, penetration tests on ICS. In one case, they lost for uh, uh, $50,000 of material, and on the other incident, a uh, penetration tester um, just uh, made the, there was a big problem with gas distribution. So for several hours, the company was not able to distribute gas. So yeah, that was kind of a big deal. So what you can do to prevent um, this kind of incident, um, you can use the, the switch scan delay, which will really, really uh, make the scan go slower, but it's also safer. Uh, you should do a TCP scan instead of a SYN scan, uh, because when you do a SYN scan uh, for some devices, they will try to keep the connection open for a long time, since you, you never do the full handshake, and that's going to crash them. And also, uh, try not to use any fingerprinting function, and uh, if you have to use some NMAT plugins, uh, be wise in the selection of those plugins. Um, so yeah, that's the theory. However, here, uh, Let's say on this small lab, we're gonna um, we're gonna try to be quite uh, fast. Uh, so I'm gonna fire and map. Um, so you see, if I input scan, de sorry, scan delay equals one. And then I'm going to try to scan the, let's say, the Siemens. Yeah. Also, input, uh, use the end switch to prevent uh, DNS reverse uh, looking. So, as you can see, it's really slow, and I'm using a direct uh, Ethernet cable uh, on a local network. So it's really slow, but let's say it's safe. For today, I'm just uh, going to do a classical Nmap scan. So as you can see, the only open service found was uh, HTTPS. That's because we did not perform a full TCP scan. So if you want to actually scan all the ports, we have to uh, use the P switch. And now I'm going to do a, a full TCP scan. If it does not take too long, too much time, yet yeah, it's quite long. So I'm just going to give you the answer. Yeah, so the two ports that you should be able to see in TCP are uh, 443, that's used for HTTPS, and uh, 102, that's actually the, the proprietary protocol that Siemens uses to communicate uh, with the, the programming software. Um, if I do the same for the, let's say for the Schneider, uh, you should be able to find some FTP, HTTP, uh, and some uh, Modbus ports. Yes, they are all open. 
Does that work for you also? Okay, so I just cheated because I wanted to, to get fast on the Nmap scan. Um, you can also find online some specific Nmap scripts for ICS. I know that Digital Bond uh, released some recently. It's, I think it's a project called uh, Redpoint. That's a, so that could be a nice uh, resource to take a look at. And uh, now we're going to use a different tool that is uh, specifically designed for ICS. was made from the Scala Strangelove team. It's called uh, PLC Scan. So it's not like Nmap, so it's not going to find all the open ports. It's just going to focus on the Modbus port and the, the port used by Siemens. So it's only a uh, port scanning two ports. But uh, since these are legitimate requests, um, there's really a low chance that you will crash anything by doing that. So what you can do is go to the tools uh, directory and then uh, you should have PLC scan, I think. It's a Python script, so you can take a look at the source code if you want. Um, if you take a look at the help. But anyway, I'm just going to do a classical scan. So I'm going to scan the whole range. Uh, so it's 0 slash 24. So as you can see, it's not really uh, fast. It takes one IP after one IP and tries to communicate with the port 102 or 502. So quite quickly, we can see that uh, the Schneider uh, PLC was detected. Um, the unit ID uh, for which uh, there was a response received is 0 or 255. We can see that we have some information about the the hardware modules. So actually, uh, 2030 is the, the model of the CPU. So the, the scan is still running. Uh, when it reaches uh, the dot 50, we'll, we'll have some information about the, the Siemens PLC. Is it working? Yes? OK. So I'm not going to wait. I'm just going to scan the dot .50. And uh, same way for the Siemens, you see that uh, some information was already uh, gathered, like the firmware version or the hardware version of the, of the CPU. You should get the same results. No? OK. It's funny. Uh, the, the only difference is that I'm using the, this cable and you're using the Wi-Fi, so maybe that's the source of the problem. Did it work for the, for the Schneider? Yes, and not for the Siemens? OK, quite strange. <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, it's a PLC scan. It's the, let's say the standard version. I downloaded it two weeks ago, I think. Okay, so we just saw two different ways of uh, identifying PLCs on the network. Uh, there's a third way, which is called SNMP, and I'm going to show you how. Actually, by default, uh, the PLC responds to um, SNMP requests. So, um, in um, let's say in Kali, you have a, call, uh, a tool that is called SNMP check. Uh, you use the switch uh, T and then you input the IP address. So in this case, SNMP, SNMP check uh, minus T and then uh, the dot five. And it's going to give you uh, a lot of information. So if I start, you have the hardware version. Then you have the network configuration. And then something that's quite interesting, you have the different network routes configured. 
and also um, all the listening ports on TCP and UDP. So instead of performing a network scan, you just you can just perform a SNMP request and it will tell you what are the ports available. So that can come handy also. Uh, I can do the same on the Siemens. I think I should get similar results. Um, you see that there is three different uh, UDP ports. I actually do not know what the last two are used for. And I do not have the, um, the list of uh, listening TCP ports. So did not have the same level of information, but that's kind of interesting to know. Just by sending a SNMP request, you can gather interesting information. Yes, exactly. If, for example, um, maybe it's a good idea. I'm going to try to do that. So I will launch uh, Unity Pro, which is a Schneider uh, programming software. Okay. I'm going to try to connect. Um, so yes, now I'm connected. I'm going to start the PLC again. Um, and then we set on dot five. So yes. Uh, wait, that's me. That should be me. So you actually have the IP address of the programming software. And also someone on the FTP. Yes. I do not use it during this uh, demonstration, but yes, I think it should be a 51 or something, the IP, uh, between 50 and 60, I don't know. So apparently someone just put the PLC back in uh, stop mode. That's why the light shut off. Um, okay. And back on. Okay, so next what we can do is try to take a look at those, uh, let's say, interfaces that we discovered. For example, the FTP, the HTTP. Try to find some vulnerabilities. Uh, once again, everything that I'm going to demonstrate is already known, so uh, no zero day today. Um, okay, so let's take a look at the web interface. Actually, I think it will not work on your VM because I failed to install uh, the Java uh, Modia plugin. And the uh, web interface of the Schneider heavily relies on uh, Java uh, applets. So as you can see, it really looks like the one from the internet. And uh, for example, if I try to go to the monitoring tab, uh, I just have two options that are called data editor. I'm going to click on the standard one, and then I have um, a pop-up that uh, asks me to input some uh, password. So do you know the password? Did anyone try to guess the password? Sorry? Nope. Yes. And the password? Nope. User, user. This can be changed, of course. Of a, yeah. <laughs> so here you can see that you have a nice Java applet that should allow you to perform some kind of uh, modification on the PLC. Uh, you should modify the, should be able to modify um, the, some data. Um, I think the the value of the register and the coils. What else do we have? Um, Basically, you can see what the PLC looks like. If you're not just near the PLC, uh, you can see that it's in run mode. And then you have an input-output card. Some information about the, the firmware. And in the setup menu, you can modify some, uh, some of the things, uh, like the HTTP access rights. 
and uh, specific passwords. Okay. Um, so now what we can do is, um, let me go back here. So as I told you, there is a lot of uh, several Java applets on this uh, web server. Uh, if you look in the files directory on the VM, there's a subdirectory that is called jars uh, and that contains all the Java applets that I recovered from the, from the PLC. Uh, so what would be interesting to do is try to, uh, let's say, decompile those applets or perform any kind of um, analysis to see what, what is in the, in the applets. So the most basic one would be to perform a, a string query, of course. Uh, so I'm going to look for any uh, word that's longer than six characters in the, um, in the applets. And here you can pick whatever, whichever you want. I'm going to try this. Strings. Sorry? Yes, it works. We're going to see it. Um, I pipe, pipe it into more. Uh, so as you can see, you can find some information. And what we are going to look for is maybe I don't know, we could grab for password or username, things like that. Anyway, you can see that you can recover some kind of information. I think you also should have uh, on your VM, um, let's go into the tools directory, you should have something that's called uh, GDGuy, which is a Java decompiler. So on my VM it's not working, but you should launch it. I'm going to launch it on my host. So if I open the same jar file uh, with the Java decompiler, and I take a look, uh, let's say maybe at the, I do not remember where it is, there is a, a misc package, and then uh, global config could be interesting. So as you can see, there's something called FTP logging and FTP password hard-coded into this uh, Java applet. So good luck for changing the password. And as suggest, we try to connect to the FTP service using those credentials to see if they really work or if they do not work. Uh, I think you already know the answer. Here you can find uh, the credits. Uh, the username is sysdiag and the password is factorycast at Schneider. So with these two credentials, you should be able to connect to the FTP server of the Schneider and then you can try to find all the files that you want. You will also be able to find a file that contains the word user, which is uh, the username and the password uh, required for the web interface. Sorry, it's too much complex of for password. So you can see a lot of things. Um, and in the RDT directory at the root of the uh, FTP server, you can find a file that's called password.rde. I think it's already in the VM and it only contains the word user. Uh, let's see, let's go back to the slide, okay. 
So that was a few examples of what we can do with the standard interfaces. And I think now it's time to, uh, to move on to ICS-specific protocols and vulnerabilities. Um, so, yes, um, let's say for the Schneider, what we can try to do is modify the value of some registers to be able to uh, put the lights on. As you can see, there's only one uh, that is on at the moment. I think two additional uh, lamps can be turned on by modifying the Modbus value. And for the Siemens, you have um, in the tools uh, slash scan7 uh, directory, you have two uh, specific tools that I uh, wrote for the Siemens. And you can also read the different values and modify the values. So, of course, if everyone does it at the same time, it's going to be a kind of a mess. But uh, I think we can try. Uh, okay, so I'm going to use MBT get uh, to, uh, let's say, read the values. And now I'm going to try to modify some values. So clearly, this de depends on the way the PLC was programmed. Uh, so for example, in my case, I can tell you, if you uh, change the value to 1, you are just to find the right address. And it should uh, put the other lights on. I think it's the address 9, maybe. Yes. And there should be another one, maybe 8. Nope. 10. Yes, the last one is broken. So uh, I'll let you play with it for a few minutes to make sure that it works. Of course, at the same time, you, should be, you could be using Wireshark to take a look at the data packets, but it's exactly the same as what we've done with the simulator. So, for example, if you use the same uh, command but you replace one by zero, you should be able to turn one of the light off. Yes. And if we all do it at the same time, it's going to go crazy. I have no idea. Actually, it, uh, it depends, does not depend on the PLC. Um, I use some kind of electrical relays because the PLC uses uh, 20, 24 volts uh, for the outputs and the lamps only use 12. So I think if we do it all at the same time, we, in maybe in two or three days, we're going to break the relays because they have a a limited uh, lifespan, but that's all. The PLC is not going to be broken. Sorry? Yes, also, because that's, a, let's say, a home router, so, yeah. Okay, so apparently that works. Um, then we could also try, oh, yeah, something, it's also interesting. Um, whatever you, you do, uh, you, I think there is one light that you will not be able to to modify. Why? Uh, because if during the, the program that I put in the PLC, I said, uh, for example, this light should be on, the PLC has a, let's say, a CPU cycle. So every, I think it's around 20 or 30 milliseconds, it will check and in, in will, uh, let's say, reprocess all the program. So even if you can turn the value to off, uh, 20 milliseconds later, it's going to turn back to on. So you, uh, with your eyes, you cannot see anything happening. Uh, OK, so now for the, for the Siemens, uh, if you go into the scan7 folder, you can see sorry, that you have uh, several uh, Python scripts that I wrote myself. Um, if you use the read new, uh, 
and you input uh, the IP address. Yes, I should be able to see the, the values of the input and the output. Uh, I'm going to just make a little test and uh, flip the two first switch. And if I do it again, yes, you can see that uh, input 0 and input 1 are now set to 1. And also the outputs. That depends, of course, of the programming software. Does that work for you also for the Siemens? Because we had problems before with the PLC scan. Uh, that's exactly the, that's the request that's written. Uh, it's a Python, and you use then the script. Okay, great. Uh, so now, as you can see in the directory, there's also um, a script that is called uh, write output. So I'm going to try to use that one. And uh, the parameters, the first one is the IP address, and the other one, uh, let's say, it's, yeah, I'm not a really good programmer. So um, there are five outputs for the, this kind of uh, Siemens PLC. So here you just have to input uh, a one for each of the, the outputs you want to put to on. And if you put a zero, it, that's uh, changed to off. So I think. This one, this will uh, shut the lights off, and this will shut two or three on. Uh, yeah, it's three. But again, anyone doing the same with a different value, let's say the, the last one gets the last word. And this time on the Siemens, uh, the relays are actually part of the PLC, so I'm sure if we uh, all send different comments, we can break the actual PLC. Sometimes, someday. And there is a nice clicking also. OK, so these scripts uh, are not online yet. They will be on my GitHub uh, maybe this weekend. I don't know. Uh, of course, it depends on the configuration of the PLC. Um, I use a specific library also. Uh, that's called Snap7. It was developed to allow third party to develop uh, software that communicates with PLC. So I'm just using Snap7 and um, a, P a Python uh, wrapper. So it's really a basic script. Do not look at the source code. It's shit, but it works. Okay, so this was for the first part, uh, and then I have two uh, other things uh, to show you. Uh, I think someone already tried the first one, which is the Metasploit module to uh, put the PLC in a stop uh, or start mode. Uh, it's actually an action that is uh, done uh, in an unauthenticated way. Sorry. So I'm hoping I have one uh, MSF console uh, still open. And no. Yes. OK, so this time we're going to use, uh, it's also an auxiliary module. It's in admin, SCADA, and then uh, modicon uh, command, I think. So if you take a look at the info, it's uh, actually some, something that was uh, discovered by Digital Bond. Um, I suggest by running this module, you also run Wireshark. I'm going to do that. Uh, I'm going to listen to one of my interface. I think this, this one should do. OK. Uh, so it, of course, I have to set the target. It's not this one. And they are just type in run. And it shuts down. OK. So now I'm going to take a look at the Wireshark capture. OK. 
So uh, as you can see, sin, sin, hack, hack, and then some modbus queries. Uh, if we take a close look, same as before, transaction identifier is zero. But that's interesting. The command that I sent actually uses an unknown function code, which is 90 or 5a in hex, to uh, send specific commands to the Schneider PLC. So that's an old vulnerability. To my knowledge, it's, it has never been um, fixed. And then when you set mode to run, you can uh, put the PLC back to run. Sometimes it will not work right away uh, because there is some kind of reservation mechanism and if I put the PLC into stop mode, I have to wait several minutes to set it to run again, depending. So that could be also kind of a big deal for your clients because if all the PLCs are shut down, then you produce nothing on your plant or factory. So. Uh, okay, then the last one I want to show you, still in uh, auxiliary admin SCADA. So it's called modicon stacks transfer, and there is an underscore ASO version. So it's a version that I modified. I think it's in the info. As of today, it's not part of the Metasploit module because uh, let's say it's not really greatly uh, coded and also it does not work all the time. Uh, it's a modification of the original module by Digital Bond uh, because there were some specific issues uh, in the module by G Digital Bond. Uh, some of the counter were not right, so I just uh, modified some of the code. Um, and I also added an action that allows to gather information. Um, so let's run that. And let's see if it works. As you know, the PLC is in a stop mode, but yes, it works. So you can recover the PLC model. Project name, as you can see, it's not correctly decoded. You can see that it was uh, done using Unity software version 5, and then you can see the comments of the project. So that may or may not be interesting. Um, what's really interesting is to be able to set the action to download. Um, then I just have to put a file name also. I'm going to say slash root slash test.apx. So this could take some time. I'm going to take a look at Wireshark to see what's going on. As you can see, more Modbus uh, TCP requests. Still using the function code 90. So I'm actually retrieving the program of the PLC using a Modbus command, which is unauthenticated and unencrypted. OK, so apparently it worked. It's a problem of a decision that someone made to use an unauthenticated protocol to uh, allow an arbitrary download of the program file, yes. That's actually not part of the Modbus protocol at all. It's not in the specification. Yes, actually this, uh, this uh, specific model of Siemens does not support Modbus by default. Uh, so yes, I cannot use this vulnerability. However, in the past, I think that uh, someone who presented at Black Hat US uh, in 2011 uh, demonstrated some vulnerabilities like an authenticated uh, start and stop on the Siemens uh, and different kind of uh, denial of service. Um, but I'm not sure he was able to download the program. I'm not sure about that. So as you can see, uh, test.apx is just, just a classic full file. Um, let's see, we're going to try to take a look at the uh, hex data. So nothing really interesting, at least at the beginning. <coughs> Here, 
Here you can see that uh, this is the project name of uh, the program. This is the comments that I put in, the Unity version. So I think the, the attack worked. Then you will see um, a lot of error messages written in French. I do not know it's, if it's in French because uh, Schneider is a French company or because I'm using a French version of the software. Uh, I have no idea. So yes, here you can see that we recovered the, the program. Um, the thing is, uh, at the moment, you do not know how to use it uh, because APX file will not be opened di directly by Unity Pro. So what I did to be able to exploit it is uh, create a dummy project in Unity Pro, archive it, and then it's uh, a file with the um, STA extension. Then you just uh, rename it to zip, you unzip it, and you can see what's inside. I think I have it on my VM, maybe. Mm, nope. I have to switch to the other VM. Okay. So here on the desktop, I should have it. Yes. So here you have a classical STA file. So that's an archive of a Unity project. OK, now it's a zip file. Uh, so you can see there are different files. If you go to binaply, you have bim station.apx. So actually all you have to do is replace this apx file by the one you just download with the module. You re rename it to station.apx and then you can open the project uh, in Unity. So that means you have, uh, let's say, the whole source code of the, P of, of the PLC project on your computer. So that's kind of interesting. What's also interesting is the vulnerability allows you to perform just the opposite. And by the opposite, I mean reprogramming the PLC using the same functions. So that's also kind of a big deal because you could, uh, let's say, seriously disrupt the industrial process uh, by doing so. Uh, so if you, want do, if you want to use the Metasploit module, uh, you can do it. But uh, if several people do it at the same time, I'm not sure it's going to work, but you can try, be my guest. Okay, and that leads me to the conclusion of this uh, workshop. Uh, I think I've demonstrated a lot of vulnerabilities, of uh, bad behavior in ICS. Now the question is, what can we do about it? Um, you can try to do some things. You have to, do that. you have to know that it's not really easy. But network segmentation, for example, uh, as I demonstrated with Shodan, uh, you can find ICS on the internet. That's not normal. Uh, I do not understand why it is the case. So uh, that's the first step. Actually, actually scan the internet or use Shodan to find your own ICS uh, and be sure that they are not on the internet. Uh, so some of my clients did and they found some interesting things. Uh, secondly, you should also restrict the access from the corporate network to the ICS to prevent attackers from getting in. Uh, for example, when we perform penetration tests, like 95% of the time we get admin um, of the Windows admin um, Active Directory domain. So if it's easy to go from the corporate network to the ICS, we're going to also be uh, admin of your ICS. So that's, that's not acceptable. Uh, patch when you can. So yes, even if you do it only once a year, try to apply uh, security patches on your uh, PLCs. On the Windows machine, you can also do the same. If you have to uh, just use a dedicated WSUS for your ICS, that's not a problem. It can be done. Um, try to apply some corporate best practices. So changing default password, that's something, well, well no, no, yeah. Not everybody does it on the corporate network, but most people do. You should try to do the same on your ICS when you can. Of course, for the hard-coded credentials, you can't. But at least do what you can do. The, sa the same for the services on specific model of PLC. You can disable the web server. You can disable the, 
um, the FTP server, most of the time nobody use it, so just disable it. And then the most important point, I think it's time to start monitoring the security of the ICS. So uh, some IPS have specific signatures for ICS. You can also define your own, that's not very complicated. And uh, in order to be efficient, I think we have to start today trying to step by step monitoring some part of it and uh, to, to be able to, to make it work tomorrow at a broader level. And so I was uh, looking for a, a good conclusion, but I did not find any. So I just put two funny pictures uh, to remind us that, yes, we can do some things to secure the ICS, but it's re really costly. And that's also why people do not do it, just simply. Okay, do you have any question for me now? Uh, I think I speak a lot, but uh, I'll be happy to answer any question. You can also uh, still enjoy the lab for a few minutes if you want to try to crash everything. No? Okay, thank you.